So my neighbors asked me some questions about the Bible, and I didn't feel like I knew how to answer it. Oh man, can you believe that? What a bummer. Church should really have something to deal with these kind of things. What do you mean? I'm glad you asked. Like some kind of ministry, you know, like where the church goes out and talks about the Bible and stuff. Like a friend telling Bible ministry. That way the church can do it and I don't have to do it. That's right. <laughs> Let's, Let's go, go tell, tell the pastor. pastor. Whoa! Who are you? I'm the church. Nito. No, not Nito. Did you not see my sarcastic air quotes? It says the church on your costume too. You don't see my sarcastic air quotes there too? I mean, what do you think church is? Some nameless, faceless building here to do all the things you care about, but you don't want to do yourself? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you stay right there. I'll go talk with your friends. You don't have to. Guess we could help. No, 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 no. I got this. Well, you stay right there, and I'll be friends with your friends. We'll have barbecues, bonfires, and s'mores, and long walks at the park. Because I'm the church, and I'm friendly. You better get yourselves out there and do something. I'm not even real. Welcome. If you're watching by YouTube, we're so glad um, the wind apocalypse came through Vegas today, and so everybody stayed at home. So I hope you're watching this week, and um, we have to joke, right? It's like snow in Tennessee or, you know, like a hurricane in Florida. People are not going to, they're, they're going to stay at home. But for those of you that are with me today, I have prayed for you. Um, this week has been a rough week. I think for a lot of people, um, I strongly believe in spiritual warfare. Eric said it. We've gotten phone calls um, about spiritual warfare, and it has been a rough week. And I have prayed for those that would be joining us this morning, that your hearts would be prepared for a word from the Lord today from his Bible, his truth. And so I just invite you to bow your heads, and let's just enter into a time of prayer and give this message and our time together to him. Lord, I thank you so much for this privilege. God, I thank you. Um, somehow, some way, you saw something worthy in me to share your word, whether it's in my own home or with kids in Kids Spring or with my friends and family in this room. Lord, I thank you for where you have placed me on my street, in Las Vegas, in this state, and in this great country. And Lord, I thank you for where you have placed my brothers and my sisters. Lord, you've brought us from all over. I love hearing when people say that you moved them here, or the military brought them here, or that a job was available here. Lord, I even love hearing the few that say, I was born and raised here and I'm never leaving. Because God, what that tells me from all of these people that have been brought from different places and different walks of life is that you have mighty plans for Las Vegas, for our city. And God, I pray that today you will use my heart and your word to bring forth a message to your people to my family and my friends. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so this past Friday, um, those of you that follow Brian or me on Facebook or Instagram or you've just been here for a long time, you've heard this story a million times, and I'm sorry, but not sorry because I'm not apologetic about it because it's part of my story. But this past Friday, Brian and I met, we call it our blind date, first date anniversary, on <laughs> 22 years ago, which seems um, crazy. I've known Brian longer than, like, more than half of my life now kind of thing. Um, 
We met on a blind date, and I want to just kind of back up just a little bit. Um, Brian was 19 years old. Um, I was 16 years old. Brian was a um, Bible college-bound student who loved the Lord, who had been radically saved um, a couple of years earlier. And I was um, a high school junior honor student lost as the day is long. Um, did not, I knew the name of Jesus, but Jesus was very much a character and a story for me. Very, I say the plastic Jesus. He was far from anything real. And um, I was a boy crazy young lady um, because for some reason I found value. I felt like my value was wrapped up in being someone's girlfriend. And I never was. I dated some gentlemen. Well, they weren't gentlemen. I dated some boys, um, but none would ever commit to me. And that screamed, you have no value and nobody wants you. So I put all of my eggs in those baskets and in making good grades. I didn't want, that's, that was my thing. I wanted to be, make good grades, not really because I wanted to make anything of myself, just because I felt like that was what I was supposed to do, which I'm thankful for it now. But um, that's where I put my time and my energy and my focus, there and wanting a boyfriend. So I had a friend, I was like, she's crazy. She, like, about me. And so she was dating a boy, and he had a friend, and they um, said, Ashley's got to, like, we need to get her on a date. And so they set me up on a blind date with Brian Mosley. He did not have facial hair then. Um... (laughs) Actually, he didn't have facial hair until about a month ago. Um, I like it. I know some people are like, I don't like it. I like it. That's, so um, <laughs> we went on a date, and um, I had no idea anything about him. I just thought he was cute. And I had a filthy mouth. I think I probably cussed, like half my words were cuss words through that date. I almost got in a fight with somebody, another girl, on that date. And what, for whatever reason, Brian called me the next day. Um, and we began a friendship, dating relationship. Now, he was smart. He was a Christian. He did not say, yeah, I'm going to make this girl my girlfriend. Um, but he listened he would talk to me on the phone. Um, we would go on random dates. I mean, I was crushing hard after him. Um, he was not crushing hard after me, but he kept calling me. He kept talking to me. Um, and one day he invited me to church. He said that there was a girl at church that liked him, but he didn't like her like that. And he was just like, I don't really know what to do. And I said, I'll go with you and show her what's up. I... <laughs> There was a, probably a little bit more attitude behind it. But I'm sure him, as a Christian, was like, yes, she, well, probably, oh boy, and yes, she's going to come. She's going to come to church. And so I went, I did not go to church for Jesus. I can assure you, I did not, wasn't like, woohoo, let me get dressed. I'm going to go meet Jesus, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to worship. I did not do any, I did not, that is not why I went to church with him. I went to church with him for him. It was going to be like a date. I was going to sit next to him, like I'm on the arm of good looking over here, and I'm going to church. And then the congregation goes, oh my gosh, Ashley, that's horrible. Guess what, friends? Um. If you are a believer, and we have unbelievers walk through this door, it might be not because they want to know your Jesus. It might be because somebody invited them and, like, pestering them to death, and they finally came to get their friend to stop inviting them. It's okay. Can we let them belong before they believe? Because I didn't go that first time and go, oh, Jesus. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you anything that happened other than I sat and I was an observer. I watched people worship and I'm like, what is this? I watched the pastor preach a message. I don't even know. It was a Sunday night. And you know, like in the South, like Sunday night church is like Sunday night church. Like we're letting it rip tater chip. And um. All I know is that we were going to go to Steak and Shake and get chicken fingers and fries and milkshakes after that service. And yes, I get to be with him, right? Yeah. Okay. I get to be with him. Well, 
he kept talking to me. He kept calling me. We kept going on random dates. And he told me I could come to church anytime. He'd come pick me up. Yes, I am going to be with him. So I keep going to church, not because I'm going for Jesus, not because I'm going to worship, not because of any of that, but I get to be with Brian. But guess what's happening while I'm going to church with Brian? I'm beginning to absorb everything that's going on around me. I'm beginning to slowly take it in. I start going to youth group. There are people in there my age, and they're worshiping and raising their hands. And I'm probably like, what are these people doing? These are not like any of my friends in school. But these people were super nice to me. They're worshiping the Lord. There's a cool youth pastor that's sharing a message. But I'm still sitting next to Brian, and I'm super cool because he's in college. Like, he's a youth leader. He is not in the youth group. (laughs) I am in high school. That means I am in the youth group. My heart was not a heart on fire for Jesus. My heart was a heart on fire for Brian. And let me tell you, the Lord can use that. It amazes me. As I think about my testimony, how the Lord saw me and saw who I was. Saw the things that captured my heart. And he divinely set up mine and Brian's paths to meet on a blind date. He didn't require that I change immediately. But he used Brian. And he used Brian's unapologetic boldness about Jesus with me to radically change my life. I can assure you that if that had not happened, I would have children that are probably a whole lot older than they are. Um, I would not be here. Um, I may not have ever gone to college, which is what I always had aspired to. But my Jesus, my God, came and lifted me up through boldness of somebody just giving me a chance. Brian could have run away so fast from me because I was so different. And it was really ugly, but he didn't. Now, here's a disclaimer for anybody that's young. I do not, I do not um, condone, I don't aspire to, I don't endorse, that's the word I'm looking for, mission dating is what (laughs) some people, like, I'm going to date that person, they are good looking, I'm going to date them right into Jesus. Most of the time that does not happen, but it's part of my, it's part of my story. Um, And I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. So I kept going to church. My heart kept softening. Brian kept talking to me. He'd play worship music in the car. He'll song back in the day, Darlene, whatever her name is. He'd be playing it in his Chevy Cavalier, throw that CD in the CD player, no air conditioning in that car. We'd ride around. He'd be playing worship. He did not care that I may not have wanted to listen to worship music. He didn't care. Brian was secure in his faith with the Lord, and my unbelief did not scare him away. And because of his loving, caring attitude toward me, his belief did not scare me away. I didn't think he was a weirdo. I thought that he was kind, and he was unlike any boy I had ever dated before. He really cared about my heart and who I was. He didn't just care about other things that a lot of times high school boys care about. He cared about me. And today, I want to talk to you about being bold. Last week, you, if you were here, you heard Brian say that um, he had a friend that had asked him repeatedly to come to church, and Brian gave him all the excuses under the sun. And then when Brian hit rock bottom, if you were at the family meeting last week, I continued that story. He hit rock bottom because a girl broke up with him. Like the girl that he loved and was going to marry, they had to break up. And um, he just, I mean, like it sent you spiraling down and he needed Jesus. 
He needed something that he could not grasp himself, and so he called his friend who had invited him a million times, um, knowing this was a safe place to go to. And Brian went to church that day and was radically changed that day because he had gotten to a point of desperation. His heart was ready to acknowledge his Savior. I'm really happy that they broke up um, because my life ended up being changed um, because of that. But he took that boldness from his friend and he paid it forward. He was bold with me. He was bold with others. The power of an invite is important. The power of patience is important. The power of loving and gentle persistence is important. The, the power of unapologetically loving Jesus is important. And the power of Jesus through his children is mighty. Jesus is mighty to save. And the power of being bold for Jesus is mighty. It's life-changing. I am a product of that. Brian is a product of that. And I want to know, can anybody else in here relate did you, are you a product of somebody being bold for Jesus and just telling you with love and empathy and care about this Savior? Did you just have a day of despair and you were like, I'm going to listen to that weird radio station, that Christian radio station. Maybe they have something to offer. And you heard the life-giving, life-changing word of Jesus through song on the radio. Maybe you're a server and the people that you served at the restaurant that night cared for you enough to get to know your name and talk to you about you. And then they left an invite card on the table with a generous gift. Christians, we got to stop leaving poopy tips. I'm being very serious right now. We got we to gotta love people to life. That's what happened to me. People loved me to life. And sometimes we, we go, hold on and mine, 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 mine. This is my time with my husband on this date night. I don't need to be kind to the server. No, my kids tell me, Mom, why do you have to talk so much to people everywhere we go? <laughs> it's just in me. It's Jesus in me, and he's given me that ability, and I'm going to use it. Maybe I'm going to go here. Maybe you're like Kanye West, and you got to a place of despair. Maybe, if you don't know who Kanye West is, Kanye West is a rapper who basically, for years, has put himself up on this pedestal that he is God. But Kanye West, I'm going to just say it, much to my heartache, he is proclaiming Jesus. That's not my heartache. It's the Christians who are saying, well, I don't know if it's real. Who cares if he's being real or not? He's proclaiming Jesus. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there are a lot of people who have never heard Jesus or have been afraid of the name of Jesus or like, ugh, Jesus, who now are very curious about this Jesus because somebody with a platform is now proclaiming his name. Kanye can reach people that I never will. I can't, speak, I can't speak it, but he sure can. We're going to talk more about Kanye later. I'm letting you know. We've been praying that this place is a place that you can come to and experience life change. We've been praying that this place is a place that you can come to and belong before you believe. We've been praying that People will come in here and they'll sit in these seats and that they can observe. That's fine. If they're like 16-year-old Ashley and like, what is this mess? Because 38-year-old Ashley doesn't worship like 16-year-old Ashley did. 38-year-old Ashley is worshiping a Savior that I know has radically changed my life. And I will worship him, worship him without abandon because he is who is worthy. I wouldn't be here. Now, um, if you are new here today, um, thank you for coming. And if you do not know this Jesus that I'm talking about, it's totally okay. We would love to meet you after service. I promise you, we do not bite. Um, we aren't going to try to just change you today. We want to hear your story. We want to hear where you're at and what you've been through. 
because we've all been through something. But today, I am talking mainly to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking to fellow believers that believe that this word is the truth. That this word sets you free. You're already there. You've already decided and you've already accepted Jesus in your heart and he's already changed you. I'm talking to you today. And I'm talking to you with love and I'm talking to you with a challenge in my heart. Let's look at Matthew 5, 13. This is where Jesus, um, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 5, 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Guys, I'm not garbage. I'm not saltless salt. He didn't say you have to arrive to be the salt of the earth. You have to do so many things to be the salt of the earth. You have to know and have read the Old Testament and New Testament to be salt of the earth. He is speaking to the believers. He is speaking to his followers, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. So let's look at some salt. I love salt. You can send emails to www ashleylovesalt.com. If you do not love salt, I love it. The more salt, the better. It's okay. I'm drinking lots of water within reason. Okay, so we know that salt is a good flavor enhancer. Yeah, who likes? Yeah, I've got it. Yes, thank you, Miss Janie. She loves salt too. It's a flavor enhancer. It's also a preservative. So guys, us Christians, us followers of Jesus, we add some flavor we are not boring. I tell my boys and I tell kids spring all the time, and I'm telling you in here, you do not have to be boring and weird to be a Christian. You are bringing light. You are bringing salt. You are bringing flavor to this world because Jesus lives within you. And salt is also a preservative. Um, if, if Things are not salted to preserve back in the old days. I was doing research. It said something about like the seventh level of death is what like meat would smell like. I don't, need, I, I don't even need to think about what the first level of death on meat sound, smells like because it's putrid, I'm sure. But salt preserved the meat. Salt preserved food. We are preservatives of this earth. We are preservatives. We are bringing forth the word of God. We are preserving this life-giving word of God. And we need to do what he's told us to do. And we need to go into all the world making disciples of all nations. That is what he has called us to do with his word. And during the time of Jesus, salt was actually such a precious commodity that it was used for payment. Like, could you imagine going to the grocery store with, like, the Morton's, whatever that thing is, canister of salt, and trying to pay for your groceries? Would that, no, you can get that salt for 99 cents now. But back in the day, it was so valuable. Everybody say valuable. It was so valuable that they would use it for payments. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You have value. Don't underestimate your value. Back at what the video showed at the beginning, let's let the church do this and let's let the church do that. Great, I agree. We are the church. Big C. It is not just the people that work inside of these four walls during the week. We are the church. We have value. We go out into all of the world making disciples of all of the nations. It could be right here on Rancho. It could be across town. It could be in another state. It can be across the pond. I do not care as long as we are going into all of the world and making disciples sharing this value that we know that we have in Jesus. I want you to stay salty in a good way. You know, like, ooh, so salty. I want you Christians to stay salty in a good way. 
Don't lose your salt. Don't lose your fire. Don't lose your passion. Don't lose your flavor. Stay in the word and go out into all the world sharing this word that we have, sharing this Jesus that we have with others. And then let's continue in Matthew. We go on to verses 14 and 15. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. So I have my lamp on my stool. It gives light. It has a purpose. I have other things too. Get excited about it. Can be very honest with y'all. The other day we went um, to a farm up in St. George on a field trip. And it got dark and they had porta potties. And before we made that two hour trip home, everybody had to go to the porta potty. There are, not, there are no lights in a porta potty. Thank God for a cell phone with a flashlight on it. So, A, you can inspect, ladies, we can inspect that seat before we sit down. Yeah, amen. Okay, I know. B, that there's no creepy, crawly farm animal, bugs, spiders, snakes, whatever, crawling around in the porta potty with you. I've never been so thankful for light. As when you have to go to the bathroom in a dark porta potty. Okay, you're welcome for that. We don't put, we don't light a lamp, light and put a box over it and say, that is so good. It looks so pretty. It's doing its job. Right? It's stupid. It makes no sense. It's pointless. If we have the light of Jesus in us, why in the world would we hide from darkness? Why in the world would we we not shine it? Why in the world would we just keep it in our inner circle of Christian friends? That is not what we have been called to do. We have been called to turn on our lamp, put it on a stand for all to see, and let that light shine brightly. That is what we have been called to. And I love that Jesus uses salt and light as he's talking to us, talking to his followers on this Sermon on the Mount. Because we can associate with this. I was talking to my middle son on the way here today, and we were talking about darkness and light. And I said, light always chases out darkness. Always. The darkness can't be like, no, no, don't want the light. Sorry, you turn on a flashlight, you're going to be able to see. Light trumps darkness. Put that lamp on a stand. Light brings comfort. My youngest son is seven, and we have to lock our door at night to keep him from coming into our bedroom. (laughs) Because he is going to always, he's going to come in there 45 times before he goes to bed. But he always goes to sleep with the hallway light on so it's shining into his bedroom because light brings comfort for him. I used to do the same thing. My closet light was on for 16 years of my growing up. Yeah, I was 16, still had that closet light on because when it gets dark, it starts to get ugly and your brain starts to go to really weird places, especially when you're a kid. And sometimes all they need to know and feel is the comfort of some light. My oldest son sleeps in a room, has these beautiful windows, and um, I thank God he's starting to sleep in. He's the kid that like 5 a.m. is up and at him, but the sunlight that blazes through his room every morning is just so powerful. Even when we close our eyes right now, everybody just try it you still sense that there's light around you. It's not completely dark. It's kind of muted, but it is there. We associate with light. And God tells us, you you have to do, like read the Old Testament and memorize this and know this many scriptures and do tithe and offering and all of this, and then you're the light of the world. 
No, he doesn't tell us that. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Look at verse 16. In the same way, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify not you, not to bring glory to you, but to glorify your Father in heaven because he's the one that has given you that light. It is the light of Jesus that burns in you in a very dark and broken world. We've all been around people that don't know the Lord. There is some filth that just protrudes from them. Filthy mouths, filthy lifestyles, filthy thoughts, filthy habits. Ugh. And then we get around people that love Jesus. And their light just radiates. Have you ever been around somebody that you weren't sure if they were a Christian or not, but you were pretty sure that they were a Christian because the light that's shown off of them? Those are the kind of people that people say, what is so different about you? But normally that question is not asked of you the first time somebody is around you. Normally that question is asked of you after you begin building a relationship. I knew Brian was different, but I didn't know why until I started started having a relationship with him. Until we began to invest in conversation. Until I really began to know him. Because, yeah, I went into that blind date not knowing that he was a Christian who was about to go to Bible college so that he could do ministry one day. I probably would not have gone into that blind date had I known all of that. Because somewhere I wouldn't have felt worthy. And I would have felt like all these other guys have rejected me. How in the world would this man of God, somebody that loves Jesus that I don't know anything about, he won't want to have anything to do with me. Relationship is incredibly important. I have a little song for y'all. Get excited. This little light of mine. You can sing it with me. I'm going to let it shine. Woo! This little light of mine. Woo! I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Do you know the next part? It's this one. Put it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amanda, am I hired? I tried. I tried. This is exactly what Kanye West is doing right now. He's not putting it under a bushel. He's not hiding it. I think, honestly, you know, people are thinking, well, Kanye, he's going to just try to to make more money by proclaiming Christ. Guys, (laughs) that is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Brian and I could be cruise ship liner host. We could host and manage a country club and make a whole lot more money because a whole lot more people would come because a whole lot of people are looking for comfort and to be pampered and petted. There's not a whole lot of people that want to go and learn truth. There's not a whole lot of people that are like, yes, we want to elect a president that loves Jesus. We do. But the world doesn't. And Kanye is telling his fans, I personally wasn't a fan of Kanye before, Kanye's telling his fans, I believe in Jesus. Here's what he said. Let me read you guys this quote. He says, now that I'm in service to Christ, my job is to spread the gospel, to let people know what Jesus has done for me. I've spread a lot of things. 
There was a time I was letting you know what high fashion had done for me. I was letting you know what the Hennessy had done for me. But now I'm letting you know that what Jesus has done for me. And that I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son now. A son of God. I'm free. And I say hallelujah. Yes. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I think it's amazing when we do just that. Let's look at Luke 14, verses 12 through 14. Then Jesus said to his host, this is what Jesus said, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But, everybody say, but. but. Gosh, you guys are a little asleep today. Everybody say, but. but. Good. But when you give a banquet, invite poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. After, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Invite the lame people in Christ. Invite the crippled people. Invite the people who are blind. Invite the people who are poor. They can't repay you. But when you get to heaven and those people have been resurrected in Jesus because you said, you are worthy enough for me to invite you. You are worthy even though you're not just like me and you can't repay me, I can still invite you in. Friends, we get a little comfortable in our Christian circles. We like to hang out with our Christian friends. There was some, someone that said once, I just, I don't like hanging out with people who are not Christians. What are we doing here then, friends? What are we doing? Guys, there's a lot of country clubs a lot nicer than the Springs Church. A cruise liner is going to take care of you far better than we can. What are we doing are we staying in our comfortable Christianity bubble? I just want to hang out with Christians. Or are we reaching out to our neighbor that has no idea who Jesus is? I'm uninterested in running a country club. I don't want to do that. And I don't think that we are here. But we constantly need to be talking about what are we doing to get outside of ourselves? Because when I get to heaven, I know I'm going to see Trish and Ray. I know I'm going to see Le Layla and Kevin. And I know I'm going to see Kristen. But I also want to see my neighbor next to her. Who lives completely different than I do. I want to see my brother and my sister-in-law. I don't want to just see you guys. I'm going to see the person at the gas station that just came off their smoke break. I'm not here for comfortable Christianity. I'm not here to put my light under a bushel. I'm not here to pat people and tell them it's going to be okay. That I will change the way I'm doing things to make you more comfortable. I want to live this unapologetic word of God. I want to invite in the blind and the poor and the lame and the crippled. And I want their lives to be completely changed because I introduced them to Jesus. And I loved them back to life. And I said, my time, my time is precious, but I don't mind meeting you for coffee. Come to a Bible study. 
Let's hang out together, even if you're cussing. (gasps) 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 The Christian circle, how dare they come in here cussing? They don't know better. And they really don't care about your Jesus. But they care about being known and seen, and then I promise you they're going to care about your Jesus. I want people to walk in here off the streets and be loved and accepted. I think Las Vegas is really cool because we're very accepting of people with piercings and tattoos and crazy hair and all the things. But we once went to a church that had a young lady, a teenager, that had pink hair. And she met Jesus and she started inviting all of her friends with weird color hair. This is back in the 90s and it was very unacceptable in the South. She started inviting them into the church and guess what? The religious church people did. She needs to change her hair color before she comes back in here. I watched as a new Christian that friend and all of her friends not return. Why are we doing that? Why? What's the point? Why can't we love them to life? Who cares what color her hair is? Y'all, I had my nose pierced once and I want it pierced again. And it might make some people mad, but I like it. For me, not to flaunt, but for me. It fell out in the shower one day. That's why I don't have it anymore. (laughs) Pink hair. I feel like it's happening. I feel like it's happening. My friends, now let let me tell you this. I don't think there's anything wrong with getting together with your Christian brothers and sisters because you build each other up. The Bible tells us that iron sharpens iron. I think it's good. But when that's all it becomes and we quit hanging out with other people and we quit quit reaching outside of that circle, oh, I want to reach outside of the circle and go over here with these Christian friends. No, that's not what I'm saying. Jesus said in Luke 14, 21, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. He was talking about this great parable. It was a parable about a great banquet. And then two verses down, it says, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. He wants the kingdom of heaven to be full and as many people. So do what you can to compel people to come in. So I've got some practical steps for you. We're going to skip ahead because I've talked way too long. I want to look at this quote real quick from a book called Missing in America by Tom Clegg and Warren Bird. It's a long quote, but hang with me. Here it goes. Jesus talked about living water to a woman at a public well. He made eternal analogies about financial investments when eating at a tax collector's home. He's meeting people where they're at. He introduced the idea of fishing for people as he hung out at a fisherman's workplace. He used agrarian terms with farmers. He used religious references with synagogue scholars and banking concepts with wealthy people. Jesus acknowledged the language and demeanor demeanor of the culture and started there. He modeled how to be in the world, but not of it. My challenge to you is to meet people where they're at. With what resources you have. Thank you. We need to learn to live with outreach in mind. We need the passion to let our light shine so brightly in our hearts. But how in the world do we do that? And I call this living in 3D. The first thing you do is develop friendships. People could care less how much you know until they know how much you care. I do not want you going into the gas station unless the Lord leads you to do this and just instantly say to the clerk, you need to be saved in Jesus' name. You're not building anything there, but if you go to the same gas station every day, get to know his or her name. Find out about their family. Start there and get to know them. 
discover their stories. Let me tell you this real quick about developing friendships. We go to Taekwondo. We've been going for five years. We know them. We know our instructors and all of the, the people that work there. We know them. And the other day, they gave us this fantastic opportunity. They are doing a trunk or treat this coming Friday night as their outreach. And as our instructor is going over the class announcements while we're stretching, he said, Miss Mosley, the church can do a trunk at the trunk or treat. Y'all, a secular organization invited our church in to do a trunk at their trunk or treat. That means we can tell people all about Jesus all over that candy we're passing out. But sometimes as Christians, we're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not touching Halloween with a 10-foot pole. That is Satan's holiday. <sighs> I'm not afraid of him. I say, all right, Satan, you got a holiday? Kids are coming to my door. Kids are going to come to this trunk at this trunk or treat, and they're going to be dressed up with blood and all kinds of nasty all over them. I guarantee you. Because it's of the secular world. And we give them candy. And on the candy, we might have something that says, the love of Jesus is sweeter than any candy. Yeah, I'll do it. Satan, I'm not afraid of you. It may be your holiday, but I'm going to leverage it. Because it's the time that people are coming to me. Why in the world would we ever turn down that opportunity? So guess what? We're having a trunk. At a Taekwondo trunk or treat. And we're going to have invite cards to pass out with our candy to invite people to come to church. I hope it's the best trunk they go to the entire night. The second D is discover people's stories. Get to know your neighbors. We're so bad about pulling in the driveway and hurrying in the house or closing our garage door and not ever talking to our neighbor. Why would we do that? God placed you there. He placed you on that street right by those neighbors who probably get on your nerves. I hope you're praying for them. And I hope you're loving them back to life. I hear Christians say, I am not turning on my light on Halloween. Absolutely not. Why would we do that? Why would you put your light under a bushel. People are begging to come to your door. Guess what we're doing at the Mosley household? We are, we are going to be having our own little outreach neighborhood block party. Just our family. We're grilling up hot dogs. We are dragging the grill to the front yard. And we're putting it on the street. And we're going to set up a table, and I have bought full size, not this full size, so don't come to my house looking for this full size, but I have bought full size candy bars that I'm going to be putting notes on there about Jesus. And it's going to be cold this Halloween night, like 51 degrees is our high on Wednesday. We're serving up hot chocolate and hot apple cider. I've got these super cool light up balloons that I'm going to be doing. Hopefully putting helium in them for kids. Because it's dark outside. And I want to see kids walking away, away from my house. Will you blow that up for me? I want to see kids walking away from my house with light-up balloons, glow-in-the-dark bracelets, hot chocolate, and candy bars that tell them how much Jesus loves them. You can't really see this, but these are super awesome. And they're super cheap on Amazon. And Amazon Prime can get them to you before Halloween. <laughs> Why would I ever turn off my light? Those Christians, they're not going to celebrate Halloween. I'm not celebrating Halloween, but I'm celebrating my Savior by giving people in my neighborhood candy because that's what kids are already going to be doing. And I might have a dinosaur costume on because it's fun. <laughs> and that is really how I feel because when I was a little girl, Halloween was big for me. Dressing up and pretending and going from house to house to house. I cannot remember one house that celebrated Jesus, but I hope the kids that walk away from our house 
and the kids and the parents. And I hope having hot chocolate and apple cider and hot dogs there just invites people just to linger a little bit longer. Why in the world would you do that? Because we love Jesus. I feel like we should be spending more money on investing in outreach around Halloween because we get really excited at Christmas. It's our holiday. Let's go do all of these things for people, which is great. But what about the other days, especially the day that is demonic? I'm not afraid of the enemy. I don't need to lock my door and stay inside. I want to shine my light for Jesus. And I invite you guys to do the same. In some way, some form, some fashion. And 3D number three is discern next steps. Pray and ask the Lord every single day when you open your eyes, God, how can you use me today to reach the people that don't know you? Can I slow down enough to talk to the person that's checking my groceries out at the grocery store? Should I pay When I'm going through the grocery store, should I pay for the person's groceries behind me? Imagine if you did that. You don't even get out of the store before they say, why in the world would you do that? And you say, because Jesus loves you. And he's commanded me to take care of you today. That's big. Pray and discern your next steps. Your outreach should be spirit Directed. I want to invite the worship team to come back up here. I apologize for going over. But I do not want us to be a country club. I don't want comfortable Christianity. I want Christianity that costs us something because it costs Jesus. He came to serve us. Ultimate servanthood. We get so busy. We get so busy paying our bills and so busy with the everyday. Believe me, I know. I live that dream. But can we slow down enough and make it part of our daily prayer that, God, I love you. You've put me here for this time in this city at my job, on my street, at this grocery store right now. How can you use me? Give me boldness, Lord. Help me to love people back to life. I can't do it on my own, Jesus. I need you.